coming of age in London during the 1980s, Edward Edenfall describes himself as everything fashion wasn't at the time, working class, gay, and black. He first worked as a model, then as a stylist, slowly changing the industry from the inside out by choosing to feature black artists, models, and photographers in his work. That was the picture that started it all. Yes. So good, man. Yeah. And you should wait to see the cover. In 2017, Edward Enninfall became the first black editor of British Vogue in its 100-year history. And this year, he published his memoir, A Visible Man. Edward Enninfall, welcome to the programme. Thank you for having me. Reflecting on the creation of one of your many luminous, iconic covers, you say, beauty can set us free if we let it. How does it do that? How does beauty do that? Yes. I mean, for me, for so long, there'd been such a narrow definition of what beauty is in the fashion industry. And at British Folk, really, we celebrate beauty in all its forms, in all its diverse forms, from sort of age to socioeconomic background to race to religion. It's a celebration of beauty today. I noticed you talking about one of your most famous covers. That's the, the All African Models covers from February this year. And you say about it that mm -hmm. it's not a special edition. It's not a special issue, just fashion in its own right. Why is it important? What's the significance of that, that we no longer have to call it special? For so long, you know, you need a special issue, the age issue, the size issue, the, the black issue. But I feel today, in this world we live in, we just have to be together. Every time you open a magazine, it would be great to see yourself reflected. So I don't believe in specials. I believe in this is the world we live in today, you know. You made a very specific artistic choice in that incredible picture in that February edition, which is the blue-toned lighting. So not only are the models wearing black, but the lighting intensifies the blackness. Why did you make that choice? Mm. For that cover, I wanted to create a very artistic cover because there was this sort of idea in fashion that black models always need to be in colourful clothes, smiling, summer clothes. And for, for me, it was very important to put them in sort of these avant-garde designers of our time, Balenciaga, Louis Vuitton, who were, you know, shaping fashion. So we just wanted to really show them sort of unapologetically black. Now, post the 1980s, British Vogue became whiter and definitely posher and less risk-taking. When you took over, what made you think that a magazine that reflected modern Britain would also be a commercial success? The success at British Vogue just showed the world. Don't forget, you know, when I started in 2017, you know, the, the popular idea was black models on covers don't sell. And we proved them wrong. You know, we proved that you can have six models of colour in a year and advertisers will respond. And I also believe that advertisers really, when you show that you know where you're taking them and that you take a risk, they will follow. You know, but you have to be very fearless. And that's what we did at British Folk. It's not just a question, of course, of skin colour in what you've done. Of course, you've put women with hijabs on the cover. You've... you've featured older women. How is it that you, um, as a man, understands the invisibility of women the way that you do? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the word invisibility is very interesting because I felt invisible my whole life, you know? I was... I am black, I am gay, I'm working class, you know? You know, I have invisible disability, so it was very important for me. Solidarity is so important. I mean, it's so important to keep celebrating and show the diversity of women. Um, your experience of being other, as you call it, in the book, it's very strong. You, as you've just indicated, you were a black gay and you were a Ghanaian boy growing up in London. Yeah. How much of that sensibility <laughs> yeah. is still with you now? I mean, it's so funny. I always say, you know, when I grew up, I, I, there's a duality that has stayed with me. You know, I lived in a, an African household, beautiful colours, beautiful clothes, different foods, languages, different smells. And then I'll leave the house and I'll be in England, you know, at school, fish and chips, very <laughs> sort of quite, <laughs> quite so different, night and day. And that, having that perspective is what has really shaped 
my work through the ages. I'm able to look as an outsider and as an insider. So it's been very important. What about your what about your mother? She was a very accomplished seamstress. Is her influence still in you? But my mother loved beauty and I grew up around aunts, grandmothers, cousins of all different shapes and sizes. So you know when we talk about the magazine reflecting different women, that's what I grew up with. The idea of beauty was so broad and my mother encouraged me to see women, you know, for what they are and I love strong women. There's a dark theme that runs through your book as well. We think as outsiders that your extraordinary success insulates you from the things that happen to other people, but that's not true. Um, <laughs> you describe a scene one morning arriving at your office in London where you were met by a security guard. What happened next? I mean, I remember, you know, I walked in, it was locked down, we were going in, and she basically directed me to the loading bay. And I remember thinking in that moment that this cannot happen to the young people in the building. It's fine that it happens to me because, you know, I'm used to it. I've been dealing with this my whole life and it's not going to stop. But I had to do something to stop it happening to the, you know, the next young person who walked up to that desk and couldn't really fight for themselves. So it was very important for me to point it out. Um, but it was also very important for me to realise that, you know, you're never too far away you know, you're always a black person, and it keeps me very grounded, really. You, you describe going into Calvin Klein. By this stage in your life, you were very successful, <laughs> deserving of being there, clearly very well-dressed, but you're still carrying an anxiety. You describe it in this way. You say it's a cloud that always hovers over a black person in a new setting. How did you overcome that? Well, you know, in the book, I talk about, you know, sort of being black, where you have to know your your truth, but also you have to know the codes of where you're working. And it took a lot of years for me to get over that, to realize that I can be myself and work in the system. But it was very important that I also tried to change the system by bringing people from diverse backgrounds up with me, you know, and having a staff that's, that's mixed, you know. So that's really, really what that time in my life helped me do today, bring up people with me, because I didn't want to be the only one. One of the other lines that you used that really struck me, you say that um, a skill for a black person is to understand how institutional white psychology works. That struck me as breathtakingly oppressive. How, how do you remain committed to beauty and excellence with that going on? I mean, you know, as I said, you know, I recognise things like unconscious biases. I'm able to sort of navigate certain spaces that maybe a lot of people of colour can and for me it's very important to keep having these conversations that it's not enough just having black models in shows or brown models but I really believe in sort of giving people job opportunities not just internships but bringing people in on all different levels mid-level, top level in an institution, because that's really... A multitude of voices, I always say, is better than just one. And so I just keep on, you know, I just keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward, that's the line that you use. And just in terms of those people that you feature, yeah. like the cover with Marcus Rashford, um, how important is it for you that you're making... Just, that you're using Vogue as a form of... as a means of social change, not just a thing of beauty? No, I mean, for me, you know, it, it's so important. We can't live in the world today and ignore what's going on. When I started at Vogue, everyone thought, oh, because of my visual background, I was going to create a fashion magazine. But it's about culture. For me, fashion, music, art, film, all fits under the culture umbrella. So that's the beauty of what we do at British Vogue. It's about culture, and under that, fashion fits. And we're able to sort of address lots of different topics that maybe you couldn't have been able to do before. You've already transformed the world that you, you work in, but I want to think about the future. You say that uh, white people show up to work unburdened. Do you think that the generation that comes after you will have that burden lifted? I hope so. I mean, you know, looking at the generation who came out after George Floyd was murdered, it, it wasn't just black people. It was a rainbow coalition of people. And I feel like this generation coming up, you know, even... Things like having to 
for gay pe kids like having to come out doesn't exist anymore and I feel like there's a whole generation who are quite fearless so I'm very hopeful for the future. On that hopeful note we'll say thank you very much indeed for joining us. Oh thank you so much for having me.